Welcome, everyone. My name is Jim Schley. I am not Partridge Boswell. And um, those of you who are devotees of this festival know that he, Partridge Boswell, is one of the co founders and longtime host of the poetry programs. But this summer, he had the opportunity to go to Ireland with a fellowship. So he's gone, and I'm here. But I want to thank him for the splendors of the next two days in this church, because he really did the, the groundwork and the invitations. Um, I'm going to make a couple of observations. If you end up staying for more than one reading, you'll hear these more than once. In fact, maybe you'll do them. We'll do them in a choral way. But I would love to have you silence cell phones and any other devices. Um, they have a habit of going off when you least expect it. Also, um, they've asked us to have no food or drink in the sanctuary except water, so keep that in mind. And the bathrooms, that's an important one. There's one straight through that door. There's another one through this door and two more downstairs. And if you are aware of anyone who is concerned about accessibility in this building, in the front there is a ramp, but there's also an elevator in the back accessible from the back parking lot. Bookstock is supported by many organizations and businesses, and you can see in your program, if you don't have a program, there are some on the back table. Um, I want to make a special thank you to some inns that have provided lodging for some of the authors this year. Ardmore Inn, Charleston House, Sleep Woodstock, Deerbrook Inn, Quality Inn in Queechy, Shire Woodstock, Fan House in Barnard, and the Woodstocker B&B. &B. And if you see businesses you know on the Program, thank them for supporting this festival. Um, also, special thanks to our bookselling partner, the Yankee Bookshop, which has books from all the readers in this venue and in other places. Um, and each of the readings is time to allow for people to purchase a book and have it signed if you like. The events of the weekend are all free. But of course, there are expenses. And we have the traditional sap bucket down below me. So if you feel like you'd like to make a donation, we'd welcome that. It will be turned into syrup. And not a penny will be wasted. And we also have an email sign-up sheet on that music stand if you'd like to be kept apprised of bookstock doings. So I'm going to introduce Char Dinar. Um, Dee Dee Cummings, who is also listed as um, presenting in this hour is not able to be here due to a family emergency, but we have Chard, who was born in 1952 in New Haven, Connecticut, and raised in Lynchburg, Virginia. He was the son of a doctor and anticipated going into the medical profession himself but until his college professors introduced him to religious studies, which he chose as his major. Ultimately, he graduated from Lynchburg College and went on to earn a master's in divinity from Yale Divinity School. Before pursuing ordination, however, he got a job working inpatient psychiatric aid at Connecticut Mental Health Center. Five years later, he left that work, not clearly not unaffected by it in terms of his encounters with other people, and decided to concentrate fully on poetry. He attended the Iowa Writers' Workshop and received his MFA from there in 1985. Returning to New England, he taught at private schools for over a decade while beginning to publish his poems in journals. His first collection, Asleep in the Fire, was published while he was teaching at Comparative Religious and Philosophy uh, at the Putney School in Vermont. In 1998, he began teaching at Providence College, where he continues to teach, and he founded the Spirit and Letter Workshop, a 10-day program of workshops and lectures in Pátzcuaro, Mexico. In 2002, he co-founded the New England College MFA program, which he directed until 2007. His other poetry collections include Interstate, 2005, Speaking in Turn, a collaboration with Tony Sanders, 2011, The Double Truth, 2011 too, Night Mowing, 2005, and Sharp Golden Thorn. 2003. He's also, and this is significant to today's encounter, um, 
he has produced two bountiful compendia of interviews with renowned American poets. The first one is called Sad Friends, Drowned Lovers, Stapled Songs, Reflections and Conversations with 20th Century American Poets, which really focuses on elder poets, some of whom are now gone. And the second one, more recent, um, came out last year, is called I Would Lie to You If I Could. So you may want to ask him why these titles. They're both pretty intriguing. Um, and Chard will say more about these books and read some excerpts. He's also going to read some poems at the beginning. Among my favorites of his poems are those that involve entwining encounters with animals, including from his most recent book, An Ornery Colt, A Pet Dog That Kills Day-Old Chicks, A Grouse, and a Doe, Mating Pigs, an enormous snake, and a bat in a wood stove. These poems are incidental in the sense of pivoting on incidents, but they work like parables as well, asking what do we see and what can we learn? He also creates poems that work like riddles, not ambiguous, but mischievous and mysterious. As I said, Jared is the professor of English at Providence College. Maybe this is why his most recent book is called Interstate, because he does a lot of commuting. And he is cr the current Poet Laureate of Vermont, ending his term later this year. He lives in Westminster West, Vermont, with his wife Liz. Please welcome Chard Denord. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction. Uh, you reminded me of many things I'd forgotten. I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to read just a th three or four poems from um, my work to start with, because I want to save time to read some of these excerpts from uh, these interviews that I've done over the past uh, seven or eight years. Um, books that I didn't intend to write, but as I accumulated these interviews, just uh, it turned, it turned into books. Um, I'll just say, now to answer Jim's question, the first title, uh, Sad Friends, Drowned Lovers, Stapled Songs, actually comes from phrases from the interviews from folks like Galway Cannell and Ruth Stone and Maxine Cuman um, and Jack Gilbert and, and others. Um, and the other title, I Would Lie to You If I Could, comes from a line in a magnificent poem by James Wright. I interviewed his widow, Annie Wright, um, and, and the poem is To the Muse, and he's trying to call his beloved Jenny back up from the Powhatan pit where she's descended. And he's so desperate to return to her, he says, I would lie to you if I could. So I'll start with um, a poem about a bird that flew into our window a few years ago called Small Black Eye. The sparrow lay stunned but still alive in the periwinkle, a victim of the window that appears as air in the kingdom of birds. I picked her up and placed her wing against my face as she came around. All the world, sky, grass, trees, shone inside her small black eye that was perfectly still as it stared at me like a stone that could see. Uh, this one, uh, this next one is about a, a deer that I, um, that I meet with every week or so down in the meadow below our house and we, we play a little game, you know, who, will, who, will, who will blink first, uh, and um, she always does. And this is about that. Halfway down, halfway down to the meadow, the sight of a doe through the trees in the meadow I stopped to stare at her, staring at me. The silence arced between us like a wire in a current that equaled strangeness over time. And since her stare was wild, so charged with fear, the moment froze on the line of sky and field, man and deer. She broke our stillness in her flight from me. I stood alone but double then as the man on the path and the memory of the man she carried with her beyond the meadow into the next meadow and the meadow after that where she returned my image to the field of her forgetting 
in which I roamed like a deer myself, remembering. Uh, Jim mentioned these animals. We, we had a, a pet grouse came out of the woods about eight or nine years ago and just sat on my knee while I was raking one day. I sat down and he just came up to me and circled me and then sat on my knee and stuck around for the next five years and would follow me down to this garden where the deer is, and uh, I named him Randy. And uh, then one day he just disappeared. But I, uh, I wrote this little um, song for him, Grouse Call, like a, you know, a square dance call. do si do and say hello to drumming bird. Slow it down, then pick it up once and a half and let her go. It's right by right by wrong, you know. Turn to your left and freeze the dough. Promenade to the field below. It may be the last time, I don't know. Alamande right with Mr. Crow. You can't go to heaven when you carry on so. Yellow rock, red rock, oh by Joe. Dangle now outside the no. Timorous beastie, beastie, oh. I miss him. This is a, I'm just going to read, um, I'm going to read one poem here about a couple out of this new manuscript called In My Unknowing. After writing all these books, I realized I know nothing. Like Socrates, the more I know, the less I know. So I thought I would write a, call a whole book In My Unknowing. But I'm going to read a poem by, about Ruth Stone. Do you folks know who Ruth Stone was? Good. She was the Poet Laureate of Vermont uh, also, and uh, just a, the, the term national treasure is used too loosely often, but she truly was a national treasure. She lived to be 96 and lived up in Goshen um, and wrote um, just magnificent uh, poems. And I hope you will all find Ruth Stone's work. She was a true Vermonter who moved here from Virginia. And she was widowed. At, um, 43 or 4 in 1958 and continued to live up here, raised three daughters all by herself, somehow found jobs around the country to support herself. And we're not right now, the Ruth Stone Trust, I'm a member, is trying to restore her house up there in Goshen into a writer's retreat. That was her last wish. Uh, so this is a poem simply called The Widow for Ruth Stone. You get when you get when you get it, she said when I asked her if she believed in heaven, which she didn't, but found useful to say she did in her poems. For the sake of the poem, she claimed, not heaven, but the unity of knowing and feeling the same thing Mandelbrot found in the fractal prop property of self-similarity, she'd say, she loved math. No different at all than the properties of her poems that just came to her. She swore from across the universe and entered her heart where they fanned the coal of her grief over the loss of her beloved Walter. See what you miss by being dead, she wrote to him in a poem called Curtains, as if what she called his change of means could read it still, wherever he was, her story, that is, about a crying jag she had one day when her landlord, Mr. Tempesta, yelled at her, no pets, no pets, upon discovering her cat on the windowsill, but then relented to make her stop. She was that sad and impossibly funny at the same time, so large in her voice that sang the difficult song for two voices in one made possible by loss. The bittersweet of her coal's invisible smoke rose to her eyes and watered them, then put them out. He never even left a note, she said, just hung himself one day on his office door like a coat. The poems just come to me now from out of the blue while I'm hanging laundry or planting flowers. I never know when they're going to arrive, so if I don't run inside, just then and write them down exactly as they sound, word for word, they disappear for good. Poof. I've lost most of my poems that way. Some good ones, too. And my last poem I'll read uh, before reading some of these interviews is a kind of 
Ars Poetica. I can't, you can't write really about yourself, you know, the poet or the teacher. So I've decided uh, to call this poem Weatherman. A cloud spelled out a rune I couldn't read fast enough before it morphed into another form that changed again. So I, sh I should mention, uh, and you need to know that the slip in the poem is the pink slip. I'll start again. A cloud spelled out a rune I couldn't read fast enough before it morphed into another form that changed again. So I recited something true enough from an ancient book. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes. The screen went blank then, and then the slip. No matter, I thought, I'll drive a truck. The clouds are codes for reading the blues, I said beneath my breath as I walked out into the rain with, an, with my umbrella and attitude that kept me lean if unemployed. A hermit thrush reported the dusk somewhere in the woods on my way home, and I called back like a human bird who'd lost his wings. Light is such a fickle thing, but I sing for it. Now this, this, this is an was an impossible task, trying to find those snippets from these interviews, because everything these folks said were just so profound um, that I wanted to read the you know, entire interview. So I, I hope that you know, you'll, you'll find these interesting and maybe buy one or two of these copies uh, of these volumes that are in the back. Um, I'll start with a, um, a snippet or a segment from my interview with Jack Gilbert, who was one of America's great poets for many years and published books only seven years apart, but he, he waited until they had had aged and, uh, and into just uh, into ripe, memorable poems. So I asked him some difficult questions. I said, how do you feel you have safeguarded yourself against cleverness? He's, Jack Gilbert says, I love it, and I love vanity. It's one reason I gave up giving readings. I got so good at it, I felt I could control the audience. I said, why did you grow so wary of your talent for reading? I would like to think I was really smart at seeing my weaknesses, which were my pride and my strength. Why do you feel your pride and strength were also your weaknesses? I came to see what performance does to someone. It rots you. You become so vain. This is why I refuse to give readings, because I'm weak. It's hard to resist the power. You're like an actor who can capture the audience with your words, your style, your appearance. I ask, then where does your real power come from? Jack, I don't trust myself. I love the effect so much. It's like if you have the power to make a women fall in love with you. I don't want to become that person, that performer, that figure who can intoxicate his audience. If I wanted to, I could make a lot of money, but then I wouldn't want to give it up. What is the power in you to resist the power? I would like to think, he said, it's the strength of real pride. How do you distinguish real pride from false pride? Real pride gives up. False pride keeps performing. How do you feel in looking back on your life, your career? Grateful. I live my life so richly in so many ways. By falling in love, by being poor, I live my life in such a wide range of being me, not deliberately, but that's the way it happened. I've had an extraordinary life. I should say, I've interviewed him in 2003 and then came back and interviewed him in about 2008, and unfortunately he developed Alzheimer's by that point. Um, so when I walked into his house, he had tomato soup all over his sweater and, and a glazed look in his eye. We sat down and <clears throat> I turned the tape recorder on and he looked at me and he said, where were we? And that interview, that segment I just read was from that interview. He, he came right back, his eyes cleared up, and he remembered stuff that I'd forgotten. Maxine Cumin, how many of you know Maxine? Okay, good. Um, so I uh, had the great privilege of working with Maxine at New England College and then interviewed her. Um, 
Um, uh, a little later, after I stopped working there, I just thought I'd read a, a short segment from this whole, this interview was such, was so wonderful, um, but I wanted just to read this segment of her relationship about, with Ann Sexton. She said, when Ann killed herself in October of 1974, I should tell you that Ann killed herself about five minutes after uh, Maxine left her house, um, after having lunch with, with Ann. I felt for a long time that the fun had gone out of writing poems, the fun of sharing early worksheets, the fun of reshaping, cutting, adding the whole sport of, re of revving up, of developing the poem. And the other loss I'm speaking of our professional relationship was that she would not be th there as we spread the poems for the next book out on the floor and tested what poems went with the others, what comprised a section, etc. The fun of format, I may call it, that something we had always done for and with each other. They also had a hotline. Anne would pick up the phone and, Mac and would ring at Maxine's and Maxine would pick up her phone, vice, vice versa. I, I go on to ask her, you could conclude your elegy for Anne, you conclude your elegy for Anne how it is with this promise. Dear friend, you have excited crowds with your example, they swell like wind, wine bags straining at your seams. I will hear gathering of your, up, I will, it will be years gathering up your words, fishing our letters, snapshots, stains leaning my ribs against the durable cloth to put on the dumb blue blazer of your death. 34 years after Anne's death, do you feel you've carried Anne's mantle, worn her blazer while maintaining your own distinct voice? Maxine replied, I certainly feel I've maintained my own voice. The dumb blue blazer that I carry is, I think, common to anyone who has lost a dear friend to suicide. I've written several elegies to Anne, some addressed directly to her, as in how it is, and splitting wood at six above. Others in the third person, I hope that with the, the revisionist dream in her books, Still to Mow, I'm finally shriven. I say that with more confidence than I feel. <clears throat> um, I interviewed Ruth, who was almost completely blind. Ruth Stone, at the time I interviewed her, she was 94. Um, and um, I say this to her at one point in the interview. I said, you've read a lot of fiction. In an autobiographical poem called Pokeberries, you pay homage to your folk roots. And I recited this, uh, or read this section of her poem to her, from her poem Pokeberries. I started out in Virginia's mountains with my grandma's pansy bed and my Aunt Maud's dandelion wine. We lived on greens and, bake, and, back, and back fat and biscuits. My Aunt Maud scrubbed right through the linoleum. My dad was a northerner who played drums and chewed tobacco and gambled. He married my mama on the rebound. Who would want an ignorant hill girl with red hair? They took a pullman up to Indianapolis and someone stole my daddy's wallet. My whole life has been stained with pokeberries. No man seemed right for me. I was awkward until I found a good wood-burning stove. There is no use asking what it means. With my first piece of ready cash, I bought my own place in Vermont, kerosene lamps, dirt road. I'm sticking here like a porcupine up a tree like the one our neighbor shot, its bones and skin hung there for three years in the orchard. No amount of knowledge can shake my grandma out of me, or my Aunt Maud, or my mama, who didn't just bite an apple with her big white teeth. She split it in two. <clears throat> I said to her at another point, despite growing up, poor, female, and self-educated, you somehow went on to become one of America's preeminent poets, winning the National Book Award, the Wallace Stevens Prize, and just this month you were named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize with W.S. Merwin for your book, What Love Comes To. Yet you've never seemed enthralled with the limelight, choosing to live and write as an outlier. She responded, I'll tell you why, because I'm a woman. That's why I'm in obscurity, at least one of the reasons. Guess who runs the world? Guess who runs the government? Guess who runs everything? Men, 
darling men, and men only allow women what they want to allow them, and who wants to allow an old woman anything? Um, this next interview with Donald Hall. Um, uh, was uh, over in Wilmot. I asked him, or I said to him, poetry is a device for saying something and taking it back, he said to me. At the same time, I'll repeat that. Poetry is a device for saying something and taking it back at the same time. It's the device for double-mindedness or many-mindedness. No emotion is pure but frequently we are aware of one and not the other. In poetry, somehow, you come out with both. He went on to say, I say, your poems on love display Shakespearean suspension of emotional opposites. And he responded, concision and two-sidedness, as I say, are essential to poetry. Poetry exposes and explores more than any other art form does. One of the great values of poetry, I began by saying, I came to poetry for the sound it makes. The poem is a sensual body or it doesn't exist. Did you ever read that interview that many of us did with Harper's? I was quoted saying that poetry is oral sex. I wanted to get attention. Um, And um, let's see. Um, you know, he lived with Jane Kenyon. He was married to Jane Kenyon for many years. And then tragically, Jane passed away from cancer. And he wrote a wonderful book about her loss and grief called Without. Um, before that book, though, he wrote another book called The Old Life, which was his memoir in verse. Um, and I wrote, I wrote a kind of critical review of it. And um, because I didn't feel the, didn't feel verse worked for his memoir, but he wrote a poem at the end of it called Without. And I, I mentioned to him, uh, well, he mentioned to me, he wrote me, he was a great letter writer, he wrote, he said, I. I knew I was throwing a lot of junk across the plate, he said, but I thought I was still winning the game. But as, and I'm forgetting what poet said this, but as, um, I forget, it was Horace said or somebody said, um, but maybe there's still time in a dry season for a harvest. And so he wrote, so when I asked him about his grief, he, he said, to write about grief at the beginning kept me alive. I'd write an hour or two in the morning about it, and then I'd wait 22 hours in misery until I could get back to it. The only thing I felt was pleasure when I was working on these poems. I was obviously trying to embody grief in a particular, uh, in a particular, and in particular, and hang it out there. I worried about possible sentimentality, and then, uh, and then sent it to ten people. Then I worked on it after that, their suggestions, and sent it to ten uh, other people. Um, from the previous 20, the ones who had been most helpful. People did little things and big things. Um, okay, so I, so um, this, he was very close to Galway Cannell. He, he wrote about Galway. I asked him about if he, if he was religious and he said that he really wasn't that religious but he enjoyed tremendously going to church with, with Jane uh, in, and socializing there and being in the company of those folks. And uh, so I asked him ab about whether he believed, I asked all my subjects if they, actually, if they believed in God. And he, he said this about Galway. Galway has written out of religion so much without believing, I have no conviction that God exists or that there is an afterlife, yet I still go to church. I love the community of it and the old people. I was still skeptical with Jane, but I was further toward belief at that time and, and was devoted churchgoer. And I said, did that ever become an issue between you and Jane? No. And I say, there was strong respect? He said, absolutely. Every time there'd be communion, she'd weep. 
And I'd say Jane developed a courageous faith later in her life that became an essential aspect of her poetic sensibility as well. One sees this in such poems as Mosaic of the Nativity, Serbia, Winter 1993, Man Eating, Man Sleeping. And he responded, she knew nothing at the beginning and had never read the Bible or any part of it. I think certainly not theologians or mystics. She, grad she gradually came to it. Um, the beginning of my interview with Galway Cannell, I, I actually asked all my interviewees this question too. What hurt you into poetry? Um, and I quote Yeats, that's a line from Yeats's poem um, in memory of W.B., I mean of Auden's poem in memory of W.B. Uh, Yeats, um, where he says, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Uh, Auden saying that to Yeats. Can you think, can you, thinking back in your career, remember what hurt you into poetry, I asked Galway. I don't know. Perhaps the sense of stagnation I felt growing up in a decayed mill town in the Depression damaged me into poetry. And I said, you write about Pawtucket. He said, Galway was from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. In several of your poems, one thing that struck me when you visited my creative writing class at Providence College last year was your comment that you were reluctant to call yourself a poet. Galway said, a poet should not call himself a poet. Being a poet is so marvelous an accomplishment that, that, it, that it would be boasting to say it of oneself. I thought this well before I read that Robert Frost took the same view. I said, do you think it's dangerous to think of yourself as a poet? It's not dangerous, he said. One may hope that one is a poet or even believe it, but it's better all around if someone else declares it. In concluding my interview with him, um, I um, quote one of his poems here. Then I will go back to that silent evening when the past just managed to overlap the future, if only by a trace, and the light doubles and casts through the dark a sparkling that heavens the earth. And I said, I have one last question for you. In the last poem, Strong as Your Hold, a poem titled, Why Regret, you write, does it outdo the pleasures of the brilliant concert to wake in the night and find ourselves holding hands in our sleep? These are actually the last two lines of the poem. They make the valiant claim about what means most to you, not the brilliant concert or perhaps, or perhaps poetry also by implication but waking in the middle of the night to find yourself holding hands with your beloved. Galway responds, is it a valiant claim or is it a wonderful surprising realization? Isn't to find in a moment that we who, clo who chose years ago to live as a couple are still thrilled to be with each other? Isn't that about the most blessed thing of all? I respond, yes, and especially hearing that from you, who has achieved so much as a poet. And he responds, art is wonderful, but the moment love is smashed, darkness falls, deafness falls, nothing survives as it was. Just read maybe one more from this book. I don't have much time to read all of them, but um, this is from Lucille Clifton. Do you know Lucille? Great poet, great figure, courageous, courageous, courageous. I said, are you still writing, Lucille? Oh, I should say, when I tried to find her to interview her and I called up about five Lucille Cliftons in the Washington DC area. And finally, I, I said to the last one, hi, is this Lucille Clifton? And there was a long pause and she finally said, Trying to be. <laughs> now I knew I had her then. So I went down to Columbia and we had a great time. And she died a week later after I interviewed her. So, and I think she knew she was on her last leg, but I didn't. Are you writing still? I said. That's an odd question, don't you think? I said, yeah. I don't know how to answer it myself. She says, I'm writing. If I would be so blessed to write something I haven't written since I've been feeling badly, I've been ill, 
but it's coming back, I feel it. I don't know why it would stop. I said, well, I don't either, unless you were forced to in some way, even very prolific. That's what they tell me. It doesn't seem that way to you? No, not at all. I know how often I don't write. I was in despair or in a depression for some time, but I'm going to be okay. As I said, she died a week later. I said, so your spirits are a little better? Yeah. I said, good, that's good to hear. The girls are saying, mommy, try to be lucid. Try very hard. I said, were they worried that you weren't going to be lucid? She says, I don't know what, what they thought. I said, you know, your poems are full of references to madness and craziness. And she said, probably. I said, you have, you have a poem called For the Mad, and you love Crazy Horse. She says, I do. I said, do you associate craziness with being a poet at all? Well, a little, perhaps more than a little. Crazy could mean spirited, magical. It could be all these things. I know in a lot of your poems, I say, about craziness, you write about the poet as a kind of fool. You make disclaimers for the poet. In your poem, The Poet, you write, I beg my bones to be good, but they keep clicking music, and I spin in the center of myself a foolish, frightful woman moving my skin against the wind and tap dancing for my life. She says, I like that. I said, in your poem, Admonitions, you write sim similarly, Children, when they ask you, why is your mama so funny? Say, she is a poet. She don't have no sense. <laughs> and Lucille says, true. My kids probably said that, too. And I said, you have this wonderful sense of self-effacing irony in much of your poetry. The truth teller, the mother, the spokeswoman for lawgivers, which is the term Whitman coined for his fellow citizens. And you're calling that person, the poet, a fool at the same time. There's some truth in that, she said. What do you think the truth is in that appellation? She said, I don't know, but there's some, something that rings true to the ear. I said, do you feel poets need to be knocked off their pedestals? She said, yes. They often think they're smarter than everyone else. I said, do you believe the poet has to be on the same level as the people in order to speak credibly? Poets have to speak out of what is truth for them. Everything we say has some meaning. I'm shy. I'm really quite shy. Nobody believes it, I say. But you're sane. You've been sane the whole time we've been talking. She says, thank you. To be sane in this world is crazy. Uh, let's see. I'm going to read about five minutes more. Is that how much? Uh, ten minutes uh, from this. This most recent book, I would lie to you if I could. Um, the interviews in here, I don't have time to read everybody, but they're with Natasha Trethewey, Galway Cannell again, Carolyn Forche, who's going to be here tomorrow, Jane Hirschfield, Annie Wright, James Wright's widow, Ed Ochester, Martine Espada, Stephen Cusisto, Peter Everwine, and Stephen Sandy. Um, so, um, I'll read uh, just a paragraph here from, do you guys, do you folks know Natasha Trethewey? She was the Poet Laureate of the country so about six, seven years back. Uh, for two terms, she did such a good job. Um, and uh, her father was white, Eric Trethewey, also a poet, and her mother, who was murdered by her second husband, was a black woman. How would you respond to those who feel you're, you characterize the Enlightenment she has a wonderful poem about Thomas Jefferson called The Enlightenment. In poems like Enlightenment is male-dominated epoch that for all its intellectual and scientific advances was also racist. And she comments, you know, I think I've never actually said that the Enlightenment was male or racist. I think that that's sort of the perception that might have come. But when I introduce those poems and talk about the Enlightenment, what I talk about is how good the Enlightenment was and how much it gave us, but there's complexity in that it also began to codify for us the ideas of racial difference. What interesting, what's interesting to me about the Enlightenment is that it did, it, it did both of those things together at the same time. So what I'm interested in, in Thrall, which is the name of her, her book, her most recent book at the time, are the ideas that come to us from the Enlightenment about racial difference 
These deeply ingrained and unexamined notions of white supremacy and the twin black inferiority that we see manifest us around us all the time and that come to us from the language of the Enlightenment. How can something so wonderful do something so not wonderful at the same time? It's like, how can my beloved father also harbor notions of my difference? That is a difference that is also less than, also less than how do those things fit together? My father loves me, but does he also maybe think that the improvement of the blacks in body and mind come in the first instance of their mixture with white blood? His father told her that. Is it possible to hold two ideas like that at once? Absolutely. When I'm called a crossbreed, it's a parsing of me as well and it is rooted in the grammar and syntax of the body and of ideas about race, about difference across time and space. Now, Carolyn, um, it will be here tomorrow, uh, and I asked her this morning, she's staying with us, um, Carolyn Forche, what section of this interview she would like me to read, and she highlighted these sections that I'm about to read from their long interview that appeared in World Literature Today as, as well. And she's going to be talking about this book, What You Have Heard is True, which is the first line from her wonderful and famous poem, The Colonel. She, she, she comments here, I, I, I lean toward ethics rather than politics toward intersubjective awareness, the practice and cultivation of imaginative empathy, a sense of interdependence within the biosphere. Sezwa Miwosh acknowledges that in some poets a peculiar fusion of the personal and historical appears, and in such poets we may also observe a certain reticence. They are poets of silence as much as of the word. They have deeply assimilated personal and collective experience and have surrendered themselves to the work of poetic transmission. They are often perceived as hermetic and obscure while imagining themselves to be striving for utmost clarity. If I had to choose two poets who most exemplify this fusion, they would be Paul Salon and Ingeborg Bachmann. At the, at the end of this interview, uh, she writes, language here is regarded not as representational, but as, evidenti but as evidentiary. The word is indexical, printing toward that which happened, vortices of the imagery, metaphorical resonances, metonymic play by the music, the compression of utterance, language written in the aftermath of extremity, wars, oppression, bears the imprint of that experience, regardless of its content. It is that which is written out of that which was endured. In many respects, that is ineffable. The words come not from recollection and tranquility, but from wandering in a debris field. After we finished this interview, uh, and it was almost ready to go to print, I asked her, I added this addendum, this was in November of 2016, I said, the country is reeling in the wake of the recent election. What are your thoughts? She wrote, in times like these, and from what I know of the world, one must marshal inner strength, must be courageous and resolute, calm and vigilant, must connect with others of like mind, must compromise, must not compromise with racism, bigotry, and hatred, must also be quietly prepared for the consequences of every confrontation physical harm, imprisonment, death, must do so anyway, must go to every length to protect others. Not many humans can do this. And she goes on um, to write even more, but I, I'll end there. And she'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, just, to, just one or two more here. Um, I um, had this wonderful time. Jane Hirschfield was the easiest person I interviewed. I just had to say, it's, it's, you know, it's nice weather out today. <laughs> and she would just respond with the most profound answers. Um, and I, I, I said, in closing, I wonder if you'd say a word or two about your newest book, Come Thief, which was the, her newest book at that time. 
She, she responds, I had in mind many things, but especially an old Chinese teaching story. An old hermit returns at night from gathering wild greens for his supper, comes back to his small hut, there's almost nothing in it, and discovers he's been robbed. But the thief didn't take the cast iron cauldron, it was too heavy. The hermit picks up the pot and goes running down the road yelling, wait, wait, you forgot this. I want to invite that thief into my life. The thief is the trickster figure, is love, is loss, is time, is aging, is whatever comes in, whether you think you want it or not, and leaves you changed. I'll conclude with a wonderful little snippet uh, by Stephen Cusisto, who is a blind poet who is the uh, dean of the honors program at Syracuse University and a wonderful poet. Yeah. <clears throat> this, is, this is a kind of metaphor for all poets, whether they can see or not. I remember as a child going into the woods and getting down on my hands and knees and seeing the orchid and you find it in New Hampshire, that you find in the New Hampshire woods, they call it the lady's slipper. It's very beautiful. Getting as close as I could to that lady's slipper there down among the pine needles, that's how I see the world. So the image for me is both, as it is for all poets, an opportunity to display beauty and to bring something shimmering into the field of the poem and thereby share it with readers. There is a sharing of beauty that is at the core of all the arts but at the same time, it is also an improbable discovery, the it, meaning the lady slipper, that I would find it at all. Thank you.